after the first year, um, they had Thanksgiving. It was either after the first or the second year they had Thanksgiving. And even though, as Ryan talked about earlier about hard times in Job, even though they had lost many of their, of their members, they pressed on and they gave thanks to God. And actually, I think <clears throat> part of the story that always like kind of captures me is, you know, we think they were the Christians who came here and the Indians didn't have the gospel. And, but who was it that helped them? It was the, the Indians who didn't have the gospel who actually helped them. And so let us take heart that God always helps his people, right? And really, we're all God's children, whether we know Jesus Christ or not. We're God's children, you know. Where do we come from? God created us. So this morning, <clears throat> I'm not sure why I have both these mics, but anyways. <laughs> this morning, uh, the title of my message is Obed-Edom, A Catalyst for Change. And, oh. Right, you got it up there. Super. Um, and it's kind of a story about the Ark of the Covenant. And I'm going to, actually, before I do this, 2 Samuel 6 is where we're going to start. 2 Samuel 6, 11, and 12. Um, actually, I'm sure you all had a very good time of Thanksgiving with, you know, whoever you were with. We had a quiz at my house, a little Thanksgiving quiz, and the one question that I failed to ask everybody, it was mostly for the children, the one question that I failed to ask them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it out to you this morning, see how you're doing. Um, what, what is uh, one of the essential ingredients for uh, recovery from depression? Any answers? Good food? That, that's, that may be important. Yes, good food. A healthy diet is worth a lot. Bill? Hope. Hope. Yes. Gratitude. Yeah. Gratitude. Gratitude. That's kind of the one I was looking for, gratitude, or thanks, you know, a thankful heart. Um, so anyway, that's not, you know, that's not my message, a thankful heart. Except to say, except I will offer this to you. A thankful heart is almost like a praising heart because whenever we give thanks, the, the focus is always outward. It's always someone, it's God, thank you. Most of us don't thank ourselves, do we? Right. <laughs> so actually, giving thanks is a very healthy thing and thank the Lord that he put us together that we can give thanks. Uh, 2 Samuel 6, 11 and 12. This is a story. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And verse 12, it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And we're going to go back in the scripture to how, how did this nation, how did these people, the children of Israel, how did they lose the ark of God and where was it? And if, you know, if you're taking notes, the story of how they lost the, the ark was in 1 Samuel chapters 4 to 7. And they actually, they lost it in battle with the Philistines. Um, and it was a very, a very, very sad time. Um, uh, they had actually, when they lost it in battle, they, they lost it. I mean, it was no longer in their midst. But before they lost it in battle, they had lost it in other ways. They had lost their connection with God. They had been involved in sin, and sin had separated them from God. Um, Eli's sons, who should have been like the stewards of the ark, they were sinful men. They didn't listen to their father. They didn't do things the way that God said they should do them. You know, um, if you read the story, it's a very, very sad thing. You know, they took the offerings that the people brought, took some of it for themselves to eat. They did other horrible things, um, shameful things. And so 
you know, sin always separates us from God. And so they were separated from fellowship with God. They were separated from a tender heart. You know, if we practice sin long enough, our hearts become harder and harder. So they were in battle with the Philistines. Things had not gone well the previous day. And they said, oh, what we need to do, let's take the ark with us into battle. And so they said, oh, yes, that's what we'll do. We'll take the ark with us into battle. And so they, actually what had happened is the ark, because of their sin, they lost their reverence for the ark. It was reduced to not much more than a good luck charm. Okay, We'll take a rabbit's foot with us into battle, and God will help us. But, you know, it's no wonder they lost it, because they had lost their, they had lost their communion with God. Um, we're going to look at... Uh, and actually, Eli's two sons, the priests, were both killed in battle. The Philistines got the ark. The ark was a very sacred thing. And the next thing we'll talk about is, uh, oh, there's the picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, how, many, how many of you had any idea what, what the Ark of the Covenant looked like or what it was? Some of you did? Um, that's what it is. It's kind of a... We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit later. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on to the judgment on the enemies of God. Uh, the Philistines, namely, who, who were the enemies of God. Uh, the Philistines, actually the ark was in the Philistine territory for seven months. And first, it, first they brought it into their main city, which was Ashdod, which was where they had their idol temple, their temple to, the, to their god Dagon. Things went very badly for them there. Their God kept falling down. It was broken, and people were getting sick. People were dying. The people of Ashdod said, get it out of here. Um, they, it ended up going to Gaza. It ended up going to Gath. You, you may remember Gath is where Goliath, the giant, was from. And then, lastly, it went to Ekron. And if you read the story in the Bible, uh, when the enemies of God had the Ark of God, it was not a, not a happy day. They had tumors, they had hemorrhoids, they died. Um, and I mean, this was like thousands of people died. I mean, it struck fear in the hearts of the Philistines. And the Bible says there was weeping throughout their cities, you know, because it was such, the hand of God was heavy upon them is what it says, and that was his hand of judgment. Um, you know, we all like to remember David and Goliath. Um, Goliath had some brothers, and you know, Goliath had a mother. Um, it's possible that Goliath's family were among those who were weeping. Um, Goliath had died previous to this, right? But his mother may have still been alive. You know, in some ways, the judgments of God reveal uh, the holiness of God to people who don't even know him. You know, it's hard, to, it's hard to hate the Philistines because they were ignorant. They had no idea what was going on. And, you know, we can count our blessings that we have the scriptures, we have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and we are not ignorant. God can lead us into the truth. Um, then they sent the ark away. The Philistines said, let's, you know, they asked their magicians what they should do, and the magician said, well, what you do is you take some cows that just had a calf, and put the ark on a new cart, hook these two cows up to it, and just turn them loose and see what happens. You know, if they stay around with their calves, well then, God didn't cause these problems. It was just, you know, coincidence. But if these cows head for Israel, then we'll know that, you know, God was upset with us. Well, what do you think? The, the cows headed straight for the border. And the men on the border town, Beth Shemesh, they, they were harvesting, the Bible says. They saw the ark coming, and the ark had been gone for seven months, and everybody knew it. They rejoiced. They saw the ark coming, they rejoiced. Um, 
they actually, when, they, when the ark got there, they called some Levites who lived among them, and they said, you know, take the ark off the cart. They, they broke the cart into pieces, they slaughtered the oxen, and they had a sacrifice right there. But something happened. Some of the men of this town, Beth Shemesh, I don't know how many, the Bible doesn't say, some of the men looked into the ark. And this was a very sacred thing. They looked into the ark, and so God's hand was against them. Actually, there was a multitude of men who were struck in their city, Beth Shemesh, and these were God's people, and the Levites were among them. You know, did they look into the ark ignorantly? Maybe they did, maybe they were ignorant. Um, did they know that they shouldn't have? Maybe they did know they shouldn't have. We don't know, but this is what happened. And so they had fear, and they called to the men of uh, Kirjath Jerim, which means the city of forests. They called to them and they said, oh, they said, we have the ark. By the way, we have the ark. Could you please come down and get it? <laughs> and so, of course, it was an honor to be invited to come and get the ark. So the men of Kirjath Jerim came down. And it's interesting, interesting enough, I don't know how much you know the Old Testament or how much you enjoy it, but let me just give you a backdrop. Um, God had divided up the territory of Israel among the 12 tribes, and they had one tribe that had no inheritance in the, it, among the other tribes, and that was the tribe of Levi. Okay, they were the priests, and so they had their places throughout all the other tribes. So every tribe, if you were from any of the tribes of Israel, except the Levi, Levites, you had a Levite living somewhere near you. They had their little towns where the Levites lived. Isn't that neat? And you know, God does the same thing today. He has his people, you know, his chosen ones, his saints, his born-again Christians. He has them scattered throughout the planet, right? Is there, have any of you ever been to any place where there wasn't another Christian within 100 miles of you? Probably not. Anybody? <laughs> See, God has his people scattered all throughout the land. And it's his intent. You know, he, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. He said, you are the, you are the light of the world. He, he, said, City, that's, he said, don't hide your light under a bushel. So God has placed us just like the Levites. In fact, we're called a holy priesthood, a holy nation in the New Testament. That's what we are as his chosen, as his chosen people. And we're supposed to show his praises. Isn't that beautiful? So they sent it away to uh, the house of Abinadab in Kirjath Jerim, and they actually appointed one of his sons to be the keeper of the ark. It says they ordained him. Um, I wonder, you know, we, we do that in our churches. We ordain people to do certain things. I thought it was kind of neat to see that word, ordination, uh, in the Old Testament. Um, then this takes us um, to First Chronicles. We're going we're gonna to pick up this story, uh, more of this story, in First Chronicles 13, chapter 13, and we're going to look at it. Um, this story is actually recorded in First Samuel um, 13, First Samuel 6, and First Chronicles 13, and I'm going to read these verses. Uh, David consulted, 1 Chronicles 13, 1. David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. Um, just to give you, uh, just to give you like, just a, an insight into the history at this point in the scripture. Um, before David, Saul was king, okay? And Saul was king of all the tribes. And then David was anointed king many years before Saul died. And David first became king of his own tribe, which is the tribe of Judah. And the other tribes, like the tribe of Benjamin that Saul was from, and all the other tribes had not really joined with under King David and the tribe of Judah because it did, you know, it didn't compute. It like, it's like, well, show me that you're anointed king. You know, prove that you're God's man. It's like, 
God didn't tell me, you know, our last king was Saul. But things were going bad for the rest of the nation, and God had established David as king. He was winning the battles against the Philistines, and eventually all the other tribes realized, hey, this is God's man, and they rallied and came under the kingship of David. And so at this point, the nation became united, and a united nation is a very strong thing, right? And you know, the parallel for that is the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if we're divided in this little congregation, we're gonna be rather ineffective, we're gonna be weak, we're gonna be easy prey for the devil. And it's the same way, like, if we're divided with other congregations here in Conestoga. You know, we're talking bad about them, working against them somehow or other. You know, we become weak and, and ineffective. God's calling us to, to come under his kingship and to labor together, okay? To labor under his, under his rule. Um, so that's just a little bit of the backdrop. So this had happened and David's thinking, the ark, where's the ark, you know? It actually, the ark was in, uh, in this Abinadab, it was in his house for about 20 years. That's a long time. And so, but, but the nation hasn't been united and things haven't been, you know, so great. Oh, in fact, you know, David had a place prepared to put the ark, which was really what we call Jerusalem or Zion. And there was some heathen that had the city of Jerusalem. And they said it was so well fortified, it was like on a mountain and on a hill. It was so well fortified, the people of the city said, good luck to you, David. You know, we can keep, you know, we, we can send our lame people on top of the walls to keep you away. We're so well fortified. We don't even need warriors, you know. It's like, good luck trying to take this. But you know, God gave David wisdom. Does anybody remember the story? God gave David wisdom. Actually, the city was so high up, and the water source was, I'm not sure how far down it was, if it's hundreds of feet or if it was only like 90 feet or what it was. But there was a water tower, kind of like a little tunnel. And David's men came up the tunnel inside the city and took it. And, and let me just say this. You know, the beginning of this church, Joe Sharp and Pastor Phil and Ryan, you talked about the seven mountains of influence in this world. And you know, the way that we're going to take these seven mountains is probably not going to be to scale the walls. The way we're going to take these mountains is through wisdom. And so God's placed some of us in these places, and he wants us to draw on his wisdom for this. Okay, this is a story of David learning, okay? We probably would have done the same thing under the same circumstance. Uh, first, David says, David consulted with all the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. You know, this was, a time, this was like a time of great, um, kind of like when your favorite politician gets elected and everybody in the country is for them and you're having a big rally. I mean, he had all the captains from all the tribes and there was like, I think, you know, if you look at chapter 12, there was over 300,000 people were gathered here. At this, at this event. And so David says, oh, well, I'll consult with all you. And David said to all the congregation of Israel, if it seems good to you and it is of the Lord our God, let us send out to our brethren everywhere who are left in all the land of Israel and with them to the priests and Levites who are in their cities and their common lands that they may gather together to us and let us bring the ark of our God back to us. For we have not inquired at it since the days of Saul. Then all the congregation said that they would go that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. So David gathered all Israel together from Shihor in Egypt to as far as the entrance of Hamath to bring the ark of God from Kirjath Jerim. And David and all Israel went up to Bala to Kirjath Jerim, which belonged to Judah, to bring up the ark from there the ark of God the Lord, who dwells between the cherubim where his name is proclaimed. And so they carried the ark of God on the new cart from the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ahio drove the cart. Then David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on cymbals, and with instruments. 
And when they came to Chidon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to steady the ark, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him because he put his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. Therefore, that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of God that day, saying, How can I bring the ark of God to me? And David would not move the ark of God with him into the city of David, but took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in, in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. <clears throat> um, you know, we see David starting out here with uh, kind of like a great leader. He, 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 he had the plan in hand, and, but he still wanted the consensus of the people, so he asked them all, shall we do this? And they said, oh, yes, you know, wonderful leader, let's do this thing. And it's interesting, then, he calls, uh, he calls for the priests and Levites from all the parts of his domain, too. And they were the ones who should have known what was going on, right? He called them to kind of help him do it. And verse 3, um, it talks about bringing the ark back. It says they hadn't inquired at the ark since the days of Saul. You know, if you read this, the story surrounding this, David had been inquiring of God, and God had been speaking to him. God had been saying, yes, you know, go up this way against the Philistines and do this and do that. And God was giving him, you know, great victories. And God was speaking to him. But they didn't have the ark. They didn't have the ark in their land. And <clears throat> so, <coughs> excuse me. How had they been hearing from God if they didn't have the ark? This was like the centerpiece of hearing from God. How had, you know, how had they heard the voice of God? Well, they still had priests. They still had other various means. I haven't you know, studied this deeply, but they had ways of getting answers from God. And they also had, <clears throat> they had the same thing that we have. They had the revealed will of God, which was the law, okay? They basically had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, you know. They had all this. It was all written down, and they had, it was common knowledge. I mean, they knew this well. This was part of their identity. It's like, kind of like we all know the driving laws, you know. You know, it's like, it's common, you know. It's not a secret. So they had a lot of guidance, just like we have a lot of guidance, right? I mean, we have, the, we, we have all kinds of guidance. And then in verse 4, he's doing it. He's doing, this thing which is right in the eyes of all the people. The people said, oh yes, king, live forever, you know, this is the right thing to do, we're behind you. And the people were so excited, how could they not agree with their leader? You know, this was like an emotional high for the whole nation. And David was the one who was leading them. Who, who were the ones who knew the proper procedure? Probably the Levites and the priests. Oh, thank you, dear. They were probably the ones who knew the procedure. But you know what? They weren't even asked that day. Somebody should have given David this uh, mountain of influence thing, and he would have known that he should have went to, is it called the mountain of religion, Joe? Okay, he should have known that he should have went to the mountain of religion to find out how to move the ark. But I don't know which mountain he went to. You know, maybe he went to the mountain of entertainment, and this is the way they did it in the movies. I don't know. I mean, just, you know, just imagining. How do we function, you know? It's like, oh, well, you know, I have a problem with this. So what do we do? We, well, we go to whoever, you know. We draw on something to get an answer, don't we? I mean, we could have got it just as wrong as David, I think. Um, so... Then you go on down here. I love verse 5 and 6, and it talks about the ark. God the Lord who dwells between the cherubim. 
who, who dwells between the cherubim where his name is proclaimed. And in another translation, it talks about where his, na where his name is proclaimed and which bears his name. And you know, when you look at that ark, between the cherubim, there really isn't much of anything. It just looks like a flat top to me. But you know, there was another item that is right there, which is supposed to be between the cherubim on the top, and it's called the mercy seat. Okay, if you look in the Bible, that's where the mercy seat was. I don't know what it looked like, and you know, but it was supposed to be there. And maybe that's why it's not on this picture, because we don't know what it looked like, but it was called the mercy seat. And so, David was longing for that presence of God. You know, I don't think there was anything else of all the ways they had of hearing from God, which really had the mercy seat. The law didn't have much of a mercy seat in it, did it? The law was more like an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The law was if you, you know, if you follow me, I'll bless you. If you disobey me, you may come under these curses. And it was pretty, it was pretty detailed. So talking about which mountain of influence, you know, verse 7, the new cart, we already covered that. Uh, so which cart, you know, you know, where are we getting our ideas like of how to do church? Where are we getting our ideas of how to do marriage? Where are we getting our ideas of how to raise our children? You know, is it, which mountain is it coming from? You know, there's a lot of good things out there. You know, there's a lot of good, like in all these different mountains, government, mountain of government, whatever. You know, there's a lot of good, but you know, good isn't good enough sometimes, is it? Sometimes we need God's way. God's way will put us over. And our text is, Obed-Edom was blessed in all his house. I can't wait to get to that part. How are we doing for time? We're, rough, we're running low on time. Um, verse eight. We'll talk about this. You know, they had praise and worship. It's like, how could something go so wrong when you had this part so right, you know? They were doing praise and worship. They were dancing. They were leaping. You know, they had, who knows what they had. It says what they had, stringed instruments and tambourines. And, you know, they had everything. And something went wrong. Something wasn't working. You know, the, the oxen stumbled. Is it possible at times that we're just rolling along doing things like our relatives did them, or our father, or you know, the minister from the last church that I went to, and we're doing it the same way, and we're not supposed to do it that way. Maybe we're supposed to be doing something different, you know? Um, dear, you know, dear Uzza, it's hard to hate him, isn't it? You know, it's like, it, would any of us have not done the same thing, try to keep the ark from falling? I'm sure we would have. You know, this isn't about Uzzah's transgression. This is about the transgression of the nation. You know, God is bringing them back. It's like, how do they lose the ark? It, it, it lost its sacredness to them, right? And so now God's bringing them back. He's restoring um, the sacredness to them. In fact, David's, David, you know, David's response is very typical of a leader when something like this happens. He was angry. I mean, he just, he had his 300,000 people who had just joined, you know, with his coalition to make the nation great, and this goes wrong. He's angry, and what else is he? He's what? He's afraid. He's, David is angry and is afraid. And so, David took his, he, he, he took his hand off of plan A, and plan B was to do nothing. It's like, I am upset. And, you, know, you see if you can get me to move this ark, God, you know? It's like, I'm not touching it. You, made, you know, this made me look so bad. It's like, I, I may never be able to, you know, get past this, but, but he did. He, he would. Um, let's talk about the ark for a little bit. This won't take too long. The cherubim on that ark... Um, they represent worship, they represent praise, they represent perfection in a created being. 
as opposed to us humans who had fallen into sin and as opposed to the percentage of the angels or cherubims who fell but these were ones who represented the ones who didn't fall is there any human that hasn't fallen no we're all in the same boat so this represents this represents an aspect of god which which was a wonderful reminder and then the mercy seat even though we can't see the mercy seat the mercy speak was a revelation of who god was it, he is a god of love and really the mercy seat was like a revelation of God's heart and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us, who paid the price to forgive our sins. And then talking about what was inside the ark, you, inside the ark were the Ten Commandments, the copy, the, the tablets of stone were inside the ark. Um, even, the, even the tablets of stone represented God's heart of love because if you wanted to live long and have a happy life, Following the Ten Commandments is a better way than doing what comes natural. How about it? Do you think so? I think so, yeah. So, even, you know, even in the law that God gave, we see his heart of love. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus Christ himself said, I didn't come to abolish the law, he said, but I came to fulfill it. And what he came to do was he came to make, he came to give us a new heart a heart of flesh for a heart of stone. He came to, to make it so that we could keep the law, as it were, and be happy. You know, we could never keep the law without Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that we can keep it perfectly with him, but I'll tell you what, once your heart's transformed, do you have problems? Is it easier to love your, your neighbor? Is it easier to love your enemies? I think it is. Once you know how much you've been forgiven, if you don't know how much you've been forgiven, can you love your enemies? I don't think so. No. Is that what's the matter with the world for the most part? A lot of hate? They need the gospel, right? And remember, God's placed us, the Church of Jesus Christ, He's placed us strategically all throughout this planet. Did you know, do you know in China, only probably like 70 years ago, China had almost no Christians, like not even 1%. Do you know that today the population of Christians in China is approaching 10%? Wow. 10% of what, how many people does China have? Two billion? A lot, yeah. <laughs> many. many, yeah. Isn't, isn't that wonderful? The Ten Commandments, we have Aaron's rod. Joe Sharp, you're going to love this. What does Aaron's rod represent? Did you know Aaron's rod was in that? The rod that budded, the rod that when they placed all the rods there and Aaron's rod budded and grew and nobody else's did. You know, that speaks of the name of our church, Live With Purpose. That speaks of God's purpose for Aaron. That speaks of God's plan for Aaron. And you know, there was something about the ark which spoke of God's plan. God's plan, God had a plan. And you know, each one of us is part of God's plan. I was talking to a young man yesterday and I said, so are you doing what God created you to do? We, we, were, we were standing there looking at my cows and talking about genetics and everything. And I commented that, you know, one of these things, cows was, or maybe my bull was doing what God created it to do. And I asked him if he was doing what God created him to do. And you know what he said? I loved his answer. He said, so far I am. Isn't that a humble answer? Isn't that beautiful? I hope that all of us can say, so far I'm doing what God created me to do. Isn't that beautiful? Um, yeah, this is live with purpose church. I mean, God has a will and intent for each of us. Actually, if, pur if you don't understand purpose, just substitute plan. Live with a plan church. Do you like that, Joe? <laughs> okay, and then there was one other thing in that ark. Maybe there was some other, th two other things. One other thing that I'm thinking of, and that, at, what was that? What didn't I talk about that's in the ark yet? Yes, Jacob. Uh, well, no, I don't think that was in the ark. Maybe that was in a movie. Um, any, any other tries? Didn't they have the um, gold versions of like the rats and boils? And 
I think they did end up going in the ark after this event. Um, the manna, yes, the manna. God has, and you know, this is a reminder that God has fed us, you know, however many, was it one or two million in the wilderness? God has fed us, he will provide, and he is the good what? Shepherd, okay? He's the shepherd of Israel. And he's, and Jesus Christ is the Lord of the church, you know? He's the He's the bridegroom who's coming back for a spotless bride. We're the bride. I just think that's so beautiful. Um, the Ark of the Covenant represents... Um, that's, there's a slide. Let me try this. The presence lost. Oh, there. I went over that. The cherubim. Oh, I got that too. The Ark of the Covenant represents the presence and character of God and... The name of God, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. You know, all throughout history, God has always made a provision for those who weren't near to come into the family. You know, you see that in the Old Testament if you look carefully. There was a way for somebody who was from another nation to come in and become a part of the chosen people. There was a way. And you know what? In the New Testament, it's a lot stronger. It's like... God tells us in the Great Commission, he said, this is what I want you to do, is go out and bring them in. Right? It's to nurture and disciple the nations. Um, the Ark of the Covenant. Um, I, I love that part. The name of God, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. And in that verse that that's taken from, my name shall be proclaimed, and in the New Testament, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. Until what? All have heard, All have heard on, and until the end comes. Yeah, so the end hasn't come yet, so we're, so we're still laboring. Um, whose ark was this? Isn't that a good question? The, the men of Beth Shemesh, some of them looked into it. Whose ark did they think it was? I don't know. They may have thought, well, it's our nation's ark. They may have thought, well, it's, is it my ark? But really, the ark was God's. The ark was God's. It was God's. God's ownership. It's his kingdom, right? And who do we belong to? God. And who do the people in some other part of the world who've never heard the name of Jesus, who do they belong to? God. Original ownership. God created them. They belong to him. And they're waiting to hear how they can know him, how they can come back to him. Even our friends. You know, there's plenty of people around here who really have never heard of the plan of salvation. They don't have a clue how they could be sure that, that they could have a relationship with Jesus Christ or how they could know that they belong to him or how they could know that they're going to go to heaven when they die. They don't have a clue. They're waiting to hear from us. Um, let me go to the next one here, life-encompassing blessing. Ryan spoke, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, he spoke on the words that we say. Um, basically, by your words you're justified, by your words you're condemned, uh, you know, don't talk bad about other people, they're created in God's image. Um, Obed-Edom experienced this life-encompassing blessing. He <clears throat> First of all, was Obed Edom, you touched on this a little bit, Ryan. Was Obed Edom blessed because he said he was blessed? <laughs> when the ark came to his house, did he go around saying, I am blessed that the ark's at my house? Look at me, I am blessed the ark's at my house. No. I mean, he may have said that at some point, but that really wasn't the, the, that really wasn't the seed of it. The, the, the source of his blessing was God, God the covenant keeper. And that's the source of our blessing is God, who is the covenant keeper. And that's the most wonderful part of the gospel is we have done nothing. He's done everything. He gives us the covenant. He keeps the covenant. We're the total beneficiaries of the covenant. The source of the blessing was God. It, and so Obed-Edom 
lived in the presence of the ark, you know, it probably affected his behavior. Do you think it affected what he thought about people that he didn't like? Probably. I think he lived in the fear of God. I mean, the reverence for God was being restored right in his home. You know, I think he probably treated his wife a little kinder. I think he probably instructed his sons a little more carefully. Don't you think? I mean, do you think he wanted his sons to some night to go and look in the ark? I'm sure. I'm sure he gave them great instructions, you know. <laughs> okay? The presence of God affects the way we live. Right? Isn't that beautiful? Evidence of the blessing. Um, we're going to have to wrap this up pretty soon, but what was the evidence of the blessing? You know, we are blessed, but um, obed Edom could have said, I am blessed. But, you know, that never would have been enough to get to the king, for the king to hear that he was blessed. Well, let, let's, let's go to history. There's a, there's a, I think it's a secular historian called Josephus, and he wrote about this incident. Maybe he was religious, I'm not sure. But what Josephus had to say about this incident was that he said that before the ark came to Obed-Edom's house, he was common and he was poor. After the ark had come and been there for three months, he was so wealthy. He became wealthy to the envy of his neighbors. It was like you couldn't hide this. You couldn't hide it. You know, I bet if his family was sick, they got healthy. You know, whereas before he had been poor, now he was rich. You know, if he was walking everywhere before, now he probably had, what do you think, uh, BMW or something. <laughs> a chariot. <laughs> but just by way of helping us to think, you know, we don't need to say I'm blessed to try to draw God's blessing to us. We just need to come under God and the blessings will flow. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to have to, to really skip a lot of this. Um, but let me go to the catalyst. Um, the catalyst, I'm going to close with this. Um, the catalyst, Obed-Edom as a catalyst, and really God's will is for each of us to be a catalyst. Obed-Edom was the catalyst that King David heard about and saw and caused King David to say, okay, I was afraid and I was angry, but now I've received courage because I see that God blessed where the ark is, and now I've received joy, real joy. And David, Obed-Edom was a catalyst for King David to bring the ark back the way it was supposed to be brought back on the shoulders of the priests. Um, Paul the Apostle, was a catalyst. Uh, on the one missionary journey, well, it wasn't a missionary, when, when Paul was on the ship headed for Rome to be tried under Caesar and the, and the, the shipwreck. And you remember they had been like weeks in this storm. Paul had advised them not to go. He said, you know, this isn't good. They said, we're going anyway. And they were lost at sea for weeks. And they had threw most of the stuff out of the ship and Anyway, Paul encouraged them and said, God spoke to me in the night and said that we're all going to be saved, 200 and whatever, 70-something people. And then God told him, to, I mean, Paul told them to take nourishment. And because they did that, actually, Paul was a, was a catalyst for, for salvation. You know, there was other prisoners on the ship with Paul, and the soldiers were intending to kill all the prisoners. But you know what? They didn't kill any of them because of Paul because the centurion loved Paul and wanted to get him there, you know? So, and you know what? The lesson for that for us is God wants to use us to save many other people. Salvations of their souls and in many other ways. Um, Christ in us. Jesus told us, let your light so shine before men or shine in such a way that others can see your good works and glorify your Father, glorify me your Father which is in heaven. The presence and the favor and the grace of God, others will recognize it, they'll see you. Have some of you ever had someone say to you, you're really different. 
how could you do that? You know, how could you do that, that good deed to your enemy? Or they'll say something like, you're crazy. Okay, these are evidences that you're a catalyst. People are noticing. Or they'll say to you, you can't do that. Well, there's no law against not doing this. You know, you I absolutely can do this. I'm forgiven. You know, I am blessed. Some of you have given away like your last dollar. People say, you can't do that. Well, let them tell you again. You just did. <laughs> um, so you have been a very attentive audience. Thank you for listening. Um, I really do need to close this up here. Um, so let me just close it up with kind of finishing the story. David brought back the ark with great rejoicing and he offered sacrifices and he did all the things that he did were similar except he did it in God's way. He did it in, in the proper order and then you know what he did when it was brought back he pronounced a benediction over all the people all the crowds and he blessed all the people with a meal. Can you believe that? The Bible says he gave them all like a, a cake of raisins and a loaf of bread and a, and a portion of meat, I think it was. He blessed them. He, he really, he overblessed them. You know, when do you ever hear of a king doing something like that, blessing everybody who came? Men, the women, everybody. And you know what? That's what we're called to do. We're called to be a blessing. We're called to be givers. We're called to be those who are courageous and bold and we will speak up. We're called to be a catalyst for change. I, I, gotta, I gotta say this part yet. Fathers, mothers, sons and daughters, we're all called to be a catalyst. You know, we're called to speak things into existence that aren't. We're called to say, no, I can't do that. And I don't think you should either. We're called to say, no, no son, no daughter. Fathers and mothers can say this, you know. You can't do that. You're called to give encouragement. Say, have you ever thought of doing this? You know, something that would really impact your class or your workplace, wherever you're at. And for, for the sons and daughters, for all of you young folks that are here, you're in school. You're called to be a catalyst for change. There's going to be times when people are going to want to, you know, they'll suggest an activity or something. And you know what? The Lord will give you grace to say, no, let's not do that. Let's do this other thing. So a catalyst isn't just one who says, no, you can do it, but I won't. A catalyst is so powerful that it changes the whole mix. It changes everything. So let me just pray a blessing over us all. Lord, we pray. Lord, our hearts are yours. We pray, Father, that we would be filled with courage today. Lord, is that early song, Lord, trading our sorrows. Lord, we pray that you would exchange the things of the past for the glory of your presence. And we pray, Father, that we would be those with shining faces. We pray that we would be those with faces like flint. We pray that we would be those who would speak your words, Lord. We pray that we would be those who would receive wisdom from you. And we pray, Father, that you would give us uh, wisdom, Lord, to uh, impact the seven mountains of the world around us, Lord. I don't know who is to impact which mountains, but we pray, Father, that our world would give glory to you, that the whole earth would give glory and honor to you, our King, in Jesus' name. And Lord, bless, bless each one here. Bless them as they go, Father. We pray, Father, blessings of wisdom, blessings of prosperity, Father, blessings of reverent fear for you, Lord, from the, the oldest one of us to the youngest one. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.